¿Sabes qué? ¿Cuál es el título de ella? Es que no me acordaba del título de ella. Um, I have it right. Uh -huh. Or actually, I have it on here. Oh, no, I don't. No. No, I don't. Y de no, Gloria no. Um, well, real quickly, Annabelle. Um... Yes, okay. Um, so hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Annabelle Hauregui, and I am the Administrative Assistant for the Department of Multicultural Affairs. Our moderator today is Dr. Gordon Bronitsky, founder and president of the Bronitsky and Associates and Indigenal, which has worked with indigenous peoples around the world in the performing arts and festival de development since 1994. We can thank him for curating the speaker series. I will let him take it away so he can formally introduce our presenter today, Stephanie Salazar, General Counsel of the New Mexico Indian Affairs Department. And just a reminder that throughout the presentation, you're welcome to ask questions and enter comments throughout the chat. So I will let go, I'll let them take it away. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to welcome everyone to this speaker series put on by the Department of Multicultural Affairs at Eastern New Mexico University, bravo. It is really my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Stephanie Salazar. She's a member of the Navajo Nation and general counsel for the New Mexico Indian Affairs Department. Before this, she was the senior policy analyst for the department. She's been a committee an analyst for the house state government in the 2019 session and has also worked as the tribal prosecutor for the Pueblo of Isleta. She earned her Bachelor of Arts in Native American Studies and Political Science from the University of New Mexico, and she obtained a Juris Doctorate with a Certificate in Indian Law from the University of New Mexico School of Law, and she is currently a member of the New Mexico State Bar. That's enough from me. Now it's Stephanie. Thank you, Gordon. Um, thank you, everybody, for um, attending this this afternoon. Um, I just want to acknowledge that it's Native American Heritage Month, and it's my honor to um, be here with you today to present um, a little bit about the New Mexico Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Relatives Task Force. Uh, talk a little bit about our work um, that we've been doing over the last year and also to talk about this crisis and provide some context uh, recommendations and next steps. Um, before I jump into that, uh, I just wanna say that I am a member of the Navajo Nation. Um, my parents are George and Angela Salazar. Uh, my family is from Coolidge, New Mexico. And um, I just also want to acknowledge them today. All right. Here we go. So here's the outline of the presentation today. We'll go through the scope of the MMIWR crisis. Um, and then we'll start addressing some of the specific challenges to addressing MMIWR, the federal response. Um, and then we'll get into the New Mexico task force response, some of the recommendations, and then um, a community spotlight at the end. So the, I think to begin to understand the MMIW crisis, it is critical that we place um, this into the larger context of violence against um, our Native American relatives throughout the United States history um, and placing that, this into um, that broader context. So I think I really like this quote by the Amnesty International um, because I think it, it kind of outlines that present day reality that, and I think this is a lens that we need to start approaching this work through. So the crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and relatives, and I just wanna stop and say that the reason we included relatives um, into this title, you'll see MMIW is the name of our legislation, but Recently, we really have been talking about how we need to be more inclusive of all of our relatives um, that are impacted by this um, violence, including our indigenous men, um, children, uh, 
LGBTQ community and our trans uh, relatives. So I just wanted to state that to kind of give some context into why um, we have MMIWR. The crisis of missing and murdered indigenous women and relatives is not new. While much of its attention, while much attention has been focused on this crisis in recent years, most fail to connect the current acts of violence from those that have occurred throughout our nation's history. Indigenous people have endured through various stages of United States federal Indian policies, beginning with nation to nation treaty negotiations, then quickly shifting to relocation when Indian nations were forcibly removed from their lands. And then we moved into the allotment era and forced assimilation when Native American children were taken away from their families and raised in boarding schools and tribes across the nation lost significant amounts of land to private landowners and states. To um, currently to the self-determination era, um, which was in the night, which started in the 1960s, when federal Indian policy started to shift course. And finally, during this current era where the interests of tribal nations are starting to be acknowledged with protective policies like the Indian Civil Rights Act and the Indian Child Welfare Act. I wanna pause for a second and just talk about putting this into context and the historical trauma and perseverance of our, of our tribes um, here in New Mexico. So you'll see on the screen, um, one of the things that we've we, we really struggle to identify just all of these areas of federal Indian policy and how that impacts this state tribal relationship today um, and federal tribal relationship today. Um, but you'll see, um, I just wanted to point out that the All Pueblo Council of Governors on their website, and I had the link here, they have a really great timeline uh, down below that will allow you to kind of go through and see the various stages of federal Indian policy and state policy and how that's impacted um, our, the state of tribal nations today. So during this time, um, federal Indian law also influenced tribal jurisdiction. A series of federal case law defined the parameters of tribal jurisdiction, but most notably was the case Oliphant v. Suquamish, where the court diminished tribal government's sovereign authority. The case stated that tribal governments do not have inherent jurisdiction to prosecute non-Indians for crimes committed on the reservation without a clear statement from Congress. So while tribes have inherent authority over their own lands and members, the court reasoned that the tribe lacked jurisdiction or the inherent authority to try and punish non-Indians. And I think this case is really uh, significant because there's been a lot of work um, with our congressional delegation to introduce legislation to combat um, the impacts of this case law uh, today on tribal criminal jurisdiction. So this case directly impacted tribal justice and I will discuss shortly some of the more recent attempts to address some of the gaps created by the Oliphant ruling. But Right now, I, I do wanna shift and focus on data to help underscore the scope of this crisis in our nation. Um, and I also just wanna note that I think it's important that when we look at data, because um, numbers can be kind of numbing, I think, to a viewer, that each of these numbers or percentages, rec um, it resembles, it reflects um, someone's life and I think as Sarah Deer stated best, um, each dehumanizing number in a data set represents a woman's life. Each woman's life is connected to many other women's lives, daughters, sisters, mothers, cousins, and friends. So with that context, um, let's take a look at some of this data that's presented here. So in the United States, violence against indigenous women has reached unprecedented levels. More than four in five American Indian and Alaska Native women have experienced violence. 
according to the National Institute of Justice report from 2016, which was authored by Andre B. Rosé, the majority of American Indian and Alaska Native victims have experienced violence at the hands of at least one interracial perpetrator in their lifetime. 97% of female victims and 90% of male victims. It is important to note, however, that this violence is committed not only by non-Native perpetrators, but this is also an intra-racial problem. The same report um, from NIJ noted that fewer American Indian and Alaska Native victims have experienced intra-racial violence in their lifetime, but still 35% of female victims and 33% of male victims have experienced some violence. It's also important to note that American Indians and Alaska Natives as a whole are more likely to experience violent crimes than other racial categories. However, with that said, um, you know, I think the, the data can often be misleading and it can also make it seem as if, or not misleading, but it can um, make us assume that this is all negative and bad, um, but you know, our, our, our people are resilient um, just based on the last slide that I showed you and the amount of um, federal Indian policies that have impacted our communities that we are still here today, um, that we're still persevering and that we have um, amazing representatives and leaders like uh, Deb Holland who are representing us um, and Sharice Davids rep representing us in Congress. So it's important to also note that and to celebrate that. Um, but with these statistics, I think um, they fail in another way um, just to account for the true devastating impacts that violence has on survivors, families, native communities and tribal nations. Um, for example, among American Indian and Alaska Native women who have experienced violence, 49% needed services because of what the perpetrator did. 40.5% had to miss days of work or school because of what the perpetrator did. And the most common service that was needed was medical care. This is at 38%. Among uh, women who needed uh, services, only 32% were, or excuse me, 32 38.2% were unable to get the services that they needed. So with respect to statistics on MMIW, we have some data points, um, mostly that were provided by the um, Urban Indian Health Institute. And I wanna definitely shout out to the Urban Indian Health Institute because this report that they released, um, I think really, helped provide a national spotlight on the issue of MMIW. Um, and even in the passage of our state legislation, our legislators cited to this report as justification for why this task force um, needed to be created in New Mexico. So I think one point that I wanna make is that despite having some data, um, the reality is that we still don't know the full scope of this crisis. What we do know is that data on this crisis is scarce and non-existent. So I think one of the points of the UIHI is that much of their data was pulled um, from law enforcement records, but also because there's so many gaps in those records, they had to turn to media coverage, social media, and just have one-on-one -on -one discussions with community and family members. And so that's you know how they reached these. Um, those were their data sources. <clears throat> so um, you know another challenge with data is that um, because the our population is so small, we often get collapsed into the other category in studies and reports, um, or the something else category, as we saw uh, recently. Uh, by the C by CNN, but um, you know I think it it goes to show that there's a lot of um, outreach and education that needs to happen uh, for our general population to truly understand um, who Native American people are, where they come from, you know that the fact that we've lived here forever um, on this on this country, and um, I guess my point being that there's a lot of education yet to do. 
But um, because of this lack of data, there is an inaccurate understanding that MMIW is solely an on-reservation issue and it does, does not affect off-reservation communities. But MMIW is not limited to tribal reservations. For this reason, the Urban Indian Health Institute conducted their own research into MMIWG cases in urban areas. So they identified 506 unique cases of missing and murdered American Indian and Alaska Native women and girls across 71 selected cities in their study. 128 were missing persons cases, 280 were murder cases, 98 had an unknown status, and 29 was the medium, median age of MMIWG victims. So to provide some context for, um, I think here in New Mexico, we have a mixture of different um, communities. We have 23 sovereign nations, urban population hubs, border towns, and much of our state is rural. Each of these areas are unique in history, race relations, political dynamics, and jurisdiction. It's also important to note that two of the cities represented in UIHI, UIHI's report and in, in their list of top 10 cities with the highest number of MMIWG cases were Gallup with 25 cases and Albuquerque with 37 cases. So on this slide, um, I'm talking a little bit about the challenges contributing to this crisis. And these are the challenges I think we were aware of even before our work with the task force started. So jurisdiction, um, communication and coordination across law enforcement agencies, consistent funding for tribal justice systems, accurate data and media coverage. So with jurisdiction, who has control, authority and responsibility to respond? This can be a challenge when we have overlapping federal, state and tribal jurisdictions and the chronic underfunding of tribal justice systems further limits the efficient administration of justice, which also contributes to the high rates of crime in Indian country. Um, lack of one comprehensive system to collect and report victimization and crime data in Indian country. This is also widely reported on um, in various federal um, reports that exist. There's just various databases, but none of them necessarily communicate with each other. And so there are efforts now to kind of fix these gaps. Um, but for instance, there's the National Crime Information Center, which all state law enforcement report to. But for tribes, many of them report to, it's called CEGIS. Um, I think it's a criminal justice information support or system, I'm not too sure. But, um, but basically CEGIS and NCIC don't necessarily talk to each other. And so that can create data gaps. Um, so there are some efforts to fill these gaps. One is a program called the Tribal Access Program which will give tribes exclusive access to the NCIC database, but there is still work being done to expand this program so it can have, um, so it can reach more tribal communities. Also a lack of sufficient federal funding um, undermines the ability of tribal governments to provide criminal justice and public safety to their citizens. Really basic infrastructure needs like broadband. Um, you know, we're seeing that now a lot of tribal courts cannot meet in person. Um, they're doing a lot of their hearings virtually over the phone. Um, but if there is no access to broadband or if there's not that software and technology in place, it really does hamper the tribe's justice system and their ability to um, hold hearings and carry out justice. So finally, data deficits around this crisis are exacerbated by the underreporting by the media and often um, no reports depending on the location of where the incident occurred and miscategorized in existing um, databases. So real quickly, I wanna shift to the federal response and then I'll move to the state response. But the federal response is, 
is critical, uh, specifically the scope of Savannah's act. This was uh, two bills that were passed recently and signed by the president in October of last year, or excuse me, October 10th of this year, um, the first being Savannah's act. Um, and this act is primarily, primarily focused on directing the US Department of Justice to address the administrative obstacles related to reporting MMIW cases in Indian country. So this act specifically requires the Department of Justice to complete several tasks targeted at improving reporting by improving the national database protocols. Um, let's see. It also provides grants to tribal and state agencies who are looking to improve their own MMIW uh, policies, protocols, and training. So this is a really, um, you know, it's a great bill. Uh, you know, I think unfortunately this bill did not include funding to hire additional tribal law enforcement officers or criminal investigators, but it was still a major victory. Also the Not Invisible Act, um, this designates one official to coordinate programs and grants between the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the US Department of Justice focused on reducing um, violent crime experienced by American Indians. In this bill, Congress established a commission made up of federal agencies, various tribal state and federal officials um, and victims of violent crime to address this crisis. So I think you can see a theme um, across state, federal, and even I think through the executive order um, creating Operation Lady Justice, that there's a lot of task forces, <clears throat> excuse me, there's various task forces and initiatives that are um, being developed across the country at different levels of government to address this crisis. I think, um, you know, some of the critiques from the community level <clears throat> is that there's not enough spotlight on the community initiatives that are at play and that have been um, working to address this crisis um, well beyond, well before, excuse me, any of these um, new initiatives have been in place. So one last thing about this commission that's created under the Not Invisible Act is that it is charged with providing recommendations to both the BIA and US Department of Justice and is required to meet three times a year for the next two years. So, and I also wanted to make a point that Savannah's Act is named for Savannah um, LaFontaine Greywind of Fargo, North Dakota, um, who was pregnant when she was killed in 2017. So on this slide, um, I want to talk briefly about the Department of Justice and some of their initiatives that are in, that are at play right now. Um, recently, uh, I believe um, one of the initiatives of the of the Department of Justice was to appoint a missing and murdered Indigenous persons coordinator. They are responsible for developing protocols and procedures for responding to and addressing MMIP cases. Um, our coordinator for New Mexico is Denise Billy. She's a former uh, detect criminal investigator out of the um, Pueblo of Isleta. And she is currently our state's MMIP coordinator. So she's been working with um, various organizations to one, kind of do the same thing that this task force is doing, gather, trying to gather as much data as possible that exists, um, but also to develop those protocols and begin conducting um, education and outreach to the community. But in addition to the MMIP coordinator, we also have the cold case, um, the cold case office that was recently opened in Albuquerque and they are currently seeking cases that they can continue to investigate um, and hopefully um, resolve. So moving on to the New Mexico efforts. Um, so House Bill 278, this was passed by the New Mexico legislature in 2019 and it was signed by Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. This legislation created the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women Task Force and the sponsors of the legislation 
were uh, Derek Lente, Andrea Romero, Melanie Stansberry, and Wanda Johnson. The bill was passed with the intent of creating a task force to address jurisdictional gaps, resource gaps, and to bring attention to this crisis in New Mexico. Um, also, I wanna point out that the bill sponsors wanted to ensure that there was funding to complete this work. And so they contributed their junior bill um, monies to support the work of the task force. House Bill 278 passed the House and Senate on March 14th, and it was chaptered on March 28th of 2019. As you can see on this slide, these are some of the um, legislation requirements for the task force. And here's a listing of our task force members. I think one of the first challenges that we faced um, just being staff and trying to support this work and get um, everybody appointed, um, it really started with the appointment process. Um, but I think once we were able to get everybody appointed, these were our 11 members. And you can see in certain areas, we have more than one representative um, supporting or representing that specific um, area. So we have tribal representatives, state representatives from OMI. We have the tribal liaison of the Department of Public Safety. Um, and we also have direct service providers who provide both legal services um, to indigenous um, people, but also we have um, providers that um, offer support services. So we have Linda Sunstone with First Nations Community Health and um, Matthew Strand and Rose Rushing who provided uh, legal services at um, Out of DNA. What we've learned through our work and in meeting with other task forces across the country like Michigan and Wisconsin <clears throat> is that some of these other task forces have double the number of representatives. Um, so some of them might have 20 plus representatives on their task force, whereas we have 11. So I think that's an opportunity that we see um, in this legislation is that there is room to expand um, our representation. And that's something that we're looking at in terms of a next step of, of our work. So some of the goals and objectives. <clears throat> so we've held several meetings over the last year, uh, both in person and virtual, and each meeting had a defined objective and a specific focus based on the goals and objectives um, laid out in the legislation. At our meeting um, in January that we held, it was a closed working session of the task force, but we had a really honest discussion about what could the task force um, accomplish within its short time period of, of being in, in operation. And our timeline was really, um, I believe the end of January or July, excuse me, is our, our deadline was in July because that's when the funding initially was set to expire. So while it's, um, it sounds like we may have had a lot of time. It was actually only uh, several months that we had to collect the data and the information that we needed. Um, so at our meeting in January, we talked about um, the goals of the legislation and we kind of narrowed that down and created our own. Um, so our two main goals of the task force were to one, understand the scope of MMIWR in New Mexico and two, to build a foundation and foster partnerships and relationships to further address this issue. The goals and objectives that we developed at our January task force meeting shaped our data collection efforts. For instance, to identify the extent of open, closed and pending MMIWR cases we submitted Inspection and Public Records Act requests to law enforcement agencies throughout the state that had a high population of Native Americans based on 2010 census data. At that time, we also planned to hold community hearings in tribal communities throughout the state with the appropriate support services in place like victim advocates. 
However, uh, during this time, uh, this is also when COVID hit our communities and our, you know, in our state, our world, and it delayed for us um, much of our data collection plans um, that we were hoping to achieve. So we did submit our Inspection of Public Records Act request on March 30th, and each request asked for copies of um, police department's policies and guidelines for handling incidents or cases of missing persons, homicides, and or suspicious deaths. We also requested blank copies of incident forms to better understand what data the agency was actually collecting through its incident reports. We also asked for aggregate counts from 2014 to 2019 of solved and unsolved cases of missing persons, homicides, suspicious deaths, and deaths in custody, um, including information of race, ethnicity, and sex. So we sent this request to 23 law enforcement agencies and we received responses from 19. The overwhelming majority of police departments across our state responded that this request was overly burdensome um, or broad and that or that how they were collecting the data um, was not broken down in the way that we requested it. So to us, that tells us that they weren't breaking down um, their missing persons cases by race. Um, but you know, there could have been other issues with that data. Either way, they were unable to create the report um, to submit back to us. Only two municipal police departments provided case frequency information Seven of the agencies provided the task force with their policies and procedures. So as you can tell, just through some of these initial requests, the response that we received was almost a finding in and of itself that um, this information was either not being recorded or collected um, in a manner that would allow them to develop reports. Um, but also the fact that this is an overly broad request or overly burdensome request was also particularly concerning because it raised the question, well, is this data even being um, collected? So on this slide, I do want to talk about uh, some of the data collection activities that we were able to complete and some of the incomplete tasks that we have. Um, So like I mentioned earlier, COVID-19 presented some challenges uh, to our data collection. <clears throat> Specifically the community hearings and much of our community work. So you'll see here on the top, we, we broke it into law enforcement agencies and federal partners. And we had a separate um, data request or excuse me, data focus for tribal community services, advocates and experts. Um, Specifically, COVID-19 affected our ability to convene our six community hearings, um, de developing surveys that we could share with survivors and family members was also a challenge. And I think one of the main concerns that we had in, um, was really going back to, are we able to support people virtually if they're triggered, um, if they need additional support, and can we do this in a thoughtful manner um, within the short time frame that we have? Um, so kind of a lot of those considerations that we had, and I think really the, the task force wanting to go about this um, process in a thoughtful and informed manner, um, it really left it to us to, I think, make the final call that we would, we would have to hold off on collecting this information. And there were also some other challenges like access to broadband um, and, and making sure that all of the community members had access to um, respond to our data requests and other, um, and like our surveys to communicate with us. And so we also saw that a large majority of our community might have been excluded had we continued. So these are tasks that we hope to continue um, moving forward. And another important data collection activity that was, that was not complete was a case file review. So our project assistant at the time, Samantha Walls, um, did identify cases throughout the state. 
um, both missing persons cases and murder, uh, or excuse me, an incidence of suspicious and unsolved deaths. So should this work continue, we would want to contact the family members of the victims or lost relatives and request permission to continue this work. I think what we've been able to do in this last year was really build the foundation so that we can easily take that next step moving forward and start um, implementing, I think, some of these uh, goals that we have um, with support and advisement of our community experts. So transitioning now to some of our findings as a task force, and I'm gonna start with findings from our community meetings. So at each community meeting, we did have a, somebody transcribing and taking notes. After that, we went through and just um, started pulling out themes that, were, that we were hearing over and over again. And we turned those themes into findings. So some of our findings from the community meetings um, <clears throat> that, so community members need support and resources to navigate systems and find missing relatives. In addition, there's a need to increase community engagement in the response to missing persons. We also heard that there's a need to improve services for trauma and healing for families and survivors. At, at our last um, MMIW task force public meeting, um, we heard from our trans two-spirit and LGBTQ relatives, um, basically telling us that they needed services that are trauma-informed and that provide a safe and non-judgmental safe space for healing. And I also just want to say that, um, you know, another aspect of this that is particularly challenging for relatives who have missing loved ones is having that unknown is really hard um, and, it, and it does impact the healing process. So not having um, any type of resolution um, or answers is particularly diff difficult. And it's also why we need to have more um, liaisons and individuals within our police department who can communicate the process and where this case is at, what's happening, what are the obstacles, um, but not having any answers does impact the healing process. And also having community dialogue within our tribal communities that focuses on supporting trans, two-spirit, and LGBTQ relatives and tribal youth and other marginalized community members, regardless of tribal enrollment status, and that last point was included in there intentionally um, because we did hear oftentimes that enrollment status is a barrier to seeking support and services. Okay, so on to some of our recommendations and I'm getting uh, close here to wrapping up. <clears throat> So our survivors and families need resources, liaisons in the police department, like I just mentioned, to communicate with families. Um, I also, one of our recommendations here is education, outreach, and other preventative measures are needed. Specifically, expand support services for survivors of sex trafficking to include housing support, mental health, um, substance abuse and trafficking aftercare. Um, but one of the reasons that I think this education and outreach is important, especially to our licensed professionals, our attorneys, our judges, um, probation officers, <clears throat> and our law enforcement is that um, recently, it was last year, Searchlight New Mexico came out with an article last December um, and it highlighted the need for training on human trafficking. The article is about a young Navajo girl uh, who is 15, uh, who is a survivor, who is a survivor of uh, human trafficking. And she came across licensed professionals and five law enforcement agencies, seven healthcare institutions, and none of um, these entities asked her, questioned her, screened her about human trafficking. Um, and so training across our state is very critical 
for our professional and uh, licensed professionals and also just our community members to see what are those red flags um, for human trafficking. Another recommendation that we have um, <clears throat> is to model um, policies after our neighboring states like Arizona um, and establish certain types of MOUs or policies that would allow for the uh, further commissioning of tribal law enforcement to um, serve the role of, of state law enforcement. So um, our tribal liaison with the Department of Public Safety, um, his recommendation is that if an officer meets New Mexico training standards, they should have all the powers of a New Mexico law enforcement officer. Um, and this, like I said, is modeled off, off of Arizona law um, and it's something that he, he recommends that our state implement. And right now the commissioning is very important. We hear a lot about jurisdiction and the challenges surrounding jurisdiction, cross commissioning and entering agreements and MOUs are really the, the way to um, combat some of the jurisdictional gaps that are created from the federal Indian policy, which I talked about earlier in the presentation. So that's one possibility. In addition to commissioning tribal law enforcement, we need to push the state to streamline the process and require that all state officers also receive the special law enforcement commission. So the SLEC. The SLEC is typically provided to um, federal agents um, but state law enforcement can get certification that will allow them to have that um, federal agent badge on tribal lands. So this will easily expand manpower and response times in rural areas. So addressing the jurisdiction, jurisdictional gaps is important um, because response times are really critical, especially in rural areas like the Navajo Nation where it might take hours for a law enforcement officer to reach the scene of an incident. In a 2017 report by the United States Department of Justice in, um, titled Investigations and Prosecutions in Indian Country, it was reported that 71% of federal cases are declined for insufficient evidence. So if there was a murder case on Indian Country, um, you know, there's major crimes that the tribes cannot prosecute. Those crimes are then given to the U.S. Attorney's Office. However, this report highlights that only 71% of those federal cases, or excuse me, 71% of the federal cases are actually declined because of insufficient evidence. And this could be witness cooperation, physical evidence, and all of this kind of ties back to the initial response and the ability to be on the scene um, at a crime scene when something happens so that evidence isn't tampered with or disposed of and that um, these cases can be successfully prosecuted. And I just wanna make another point that um, I stated earlier in the slide that the funding limitations in Indian country for tribal law enforcement um, but it noted in the slide earlier that BIA only funded 21% of law enforcement needs, 49% of detention center needs, and only 3% of tribal court needs. So as you can imagine, that greatly hampers um, the ability of our tribes to provide justice to their tribal community members. Um, and this was stated recently, the Navajo Nation um, invited federal officials uh, to tribal council chambers and they talked with them about some of these funding limitations. Um, so their public safety officials reported that in 15 years, their $21 million budget had not changed at all. Mm. And so all of this I think is important to note because it supports this recommendation of strengthening cross jurisdiction collaboration with the state um, to help fill some of those gaps to ensure that there's rapid response, um, that evidence being collected and that we support the successful federal prosecution of some of our cases. So these are some of our next steps as a task force. Um, our final report we are working on um, 
very diligently. We've uh, our initial deadline was supposed to be November 1st. We're still working through it um, and we hope to have it out later this month. So the due date is um, at the end of November. Um, and so, you know, that's part of my time. I think, it, you know, lately we've, we've really just been working on trying to get um, all of our findings and information boiled down into this report so it can be useful and support um, the continuation of this work. So we do hope, I think as a next step that the task force will be allowed to continue operations. Um, there are remaining tasks that we have, um, the community hearings that we wanna hold um, and the collection of family testimony. And this is really important because as you know, you heard earlier, a lot of our challenges in getting hard data um, from our law enforcement agencies, there's this gap. And so we really need to work to fill that gap. And the way to do that, you know, we've been hearing from our data experts that, um, you know, this information does lie with the community and that does model the UIH, UIHI model of um, how they were trying to collect data, um, realizing that they would only get so far with law enforcement data um, and they'd have to turn to other avenues to really supplement that. So I think we're in the same place now and that's um, why we wanna have these community hearings and collect this testimony. We also wanna coordinate with the DOJ um, MMIP coordinator and the cold case unit. And we would like to begin implementing some of the recommendations in the task force report. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, I think moving forward, one of the um, ways that we would like to improve the work of the task force is by expanding the representation and who's um, included. Um, you know, really we need our youth representatives at the table, um, our trans two-spirit LGBTQ relatives, other public health officials, epidemiologists, uh, legislators, and tribal law enforcement. I think among others, uh, we, you know, we noted that um, right now, our Pueblo nations only have one representative, but there's 19 um, Pueblos in our state. So just making sure that the representation on our task force, um, you know, is reflective of the diversity of our communities in the state. And I just wanna kind of wrap up here just by highlighting some of our community partners. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I think we did our best to partner with as many organizations, but we certainly learned from their work, um, either by looking at their website or attending some of their um, educational and outreach events. So I just, if you want to know how to support um, this initiative, I would recommend that you um, follow these organizations on social media and attend some of their educational outreach events. And finally, I think in closing, um, I wanna share this um, statement. Uh, I wanna thank everyone here and share this message of hope from a community member who shared these words with us at our very first task force meeting. And it goes back to those strengths um, of native people. Um, and that strength really lies in our cultural values and ideals. But what this community member stated is that, um, and for all my sisters, my mother, my aunties, my daughters here, be strong. Thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for cooking for us. Thank you for holding us, hugging us, and forgiving us. And I just think that gratitude um, is very beautiful and powerful. So with that, um, Thank you all for um, giving me this opportunity to talk about some of our work. Um, and I am open to take some questions, which I think I have control of also. Um, put them in, if people would put them in the chat, I think it would be simpler. Wonderful, so, great. Thank you for an excellent presentation. I'm looking forward thank to you. some very good questions. Let's see. <laughs> No questions. <laughs> Total enlightenment. 
Kathy. I hope so. I hope that was helpful. Oh, um, so thank you everybody for your time if there's no questions. Yeah. Oh, there is a question here. Um, is there anything that students can do to help? Um, I do think that um, one of the ways to help is like I stated, um, continuing to get educated about this crisis, uh, specifically um, with the human trafficking piece. I mean, we all, you know, I'm, I'm an auntie and I have nieces. And so knowing, um, trying to educate myself on internet crimes against children so I can pass that education along to my nieces, um, you know, those are ways that we can help. I think right now we're seeing the internet um, you know, and, and there's a really great presentation done by the Attorney General's office and um, their human trafficking task force. Her name is Jenna Pfeiffer. So I would also recommend um, for future presentations, giving Jenna Pfeiffer a call and, and hearing her presentation on human trafficking. But I think the responsibility in some of these areas falls on um, us as individuals to um, do our own homework and try to learn as much as we can about the contributing factors to this crisis and try to identify ways that we can, um, one, educate each other, but also ed educate ourselves and empower ourselves. Um, I also think there was a question here about wanting clarification. Um, so only two police departments gave you the data your task force asked for. Um, so we received data from several police departments. The two police departments that responded were the only two that broke it down in the way that we requested it to be broken down, which was by race. Um, and, and also I think um, based on like the timeline. So within certain periods of time, when did people go missing? What was their race? Uh, that's you know what we requested. And unfortunately only two police departments were able to provide that. One of the interesting things that we've found is that um, what's required by all of these police departments is when they have a missing persons case, um, they're required to report it to the missing persons clearinghouse. And the missing persons clearinghouse is housed under the state's department of public safety. So when things are reported to them, the missing persons clearinghouse is now required to report that information to the NamUs database, which is this federal database um, nationally. So what we found in our data is that the, the one municipal um, city that responded, their data was very different from the county that they um, resided in. So the county data was smaller than the city data. So it kind of just shows like you would think that um, a city re would report to the county and those numbers would reflect. That's not the case. You know, we're seeing that, um, that it, it's all very isolated by department. And so that's one of those issues with the data that we need to work to resolve. Also, um, I think the data that's within NamUs is, um, already less than the numbers that are being reported out of one, um, out of this one um, police department, out of one of the two police departments that we received, we, we noticed that the NamUs data that's included there is, shows less missing persons than what's being reported from one of the cities in the state. So there's issues with the data reporting. You know, I think that's a finding in itself that this isn't a consistent, flowing um, process and we need to find out where those gaps are to truly ensure that we're um, reflecting the true state of, of um, missing persons cases in our state. Um, there was a question, who can you reach out to in Southern California to become involved? I would recommend reaching out to, um, I think the UIHI group, uh, they, they might have better contacts for California, Oregon, and Washington. So I think that might be a, a good place to start. Um, why is there such a lack in law enforcement um, or officials in help for data or just cases in general? Um, I think part of it is that 
while we have um, a state statute that mandates consistent reporting across the state, each department might have their own policies or procedures that um, have maybe different requirements. And those policies and procedures are not consistent across law enforcement agencies. Um, for instance, you know, we heard from law enforcement that no matter what, every law, anytime there's a missing person, you know, regardless of jurisdiction, they'll report it to the missing person's clearinghouse. They'll, you know, make a report. What we heard from families, however, was a different story that that wasn't actually happening in, in many cases, that the response that they received from law enforcement was that, you know, they have to be missing for X number of hours before we can actually report them. And so that's just, um, that's not true. I think if someone is missing, you know, they need to be reported. Um, that's what our state law requires. So some of those inconsistencies are presented um, uh, through some of those, um, sorry, through some of those challenges. And then I, another question caught my attention. I guess it's, I got a little distracted, um, but I have a question. What was the name of the article you used for the Navajo girl who survived sex trafficking? Um, it was called Stolen and Erased. Um, it was um, published in the New Mexico, um, I believe it's Searchlight, Searchlight New Mexico. And the article was titled Stolen and Erased. Um, and then my responsibilities as general counsel. So thank you for that question. Um, my primary responsibilities are of course to represent the Indian Affairs Department on any type of legal matter that comes our way. Um, in addition to that, you know, this initiative um, is something that we, we've taken on, um, that I've taken on, that our department has taken on, but really I just support the task force um, with administrating this, this, um, this task force and making sure that, you know, we have our meetings, uh, that we meet our goals and objectives um, in the legislation. But the task force is just one component of my work. Um, I'm also working with um, our department on a number of other legal matters. And um, you know, if there's any interest, we we are trying to revamp some of our um, outreach to youth um, through you know individuals being able to um, volunteer for our department. And so some of those efforts we're trying to revamp. I think COVID kind of made us take a quick turn on that and try to re reassess how we're gonna get um, more student and youth involvement in our work. And then I think this last point, um, do you think stereotypes such as alcoholism play a role in the lack of effort from our government to assist in the MMIW crisis? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we weren't able to get to as a task force, but we acknowledge it as one of the gaps in our work is not focusing more on border towns. Um, like I mentioned earlier, depending on the area of the state, there's unique relationships, um, historical relationships, and Gallup is a good example of that. Um, there, you know, border towns profit off of the Native American communities that surround it, but oftentimes there's racist undertones and different actions that occur, different policies that are created. And we don't, I don't think we've done a good enough job as a task force to really study um, what's happening in our border towns and taking a hard look at those policies. So that is um, a gap that we acknowledge and something we would want to address moving forward, but it does play into those stereotypes. Um, and also just the way, um, if you look at the limited, um, I think the limited visibility of native peoples and pop culture, um, it's very much sexualized. And I know that there've been reports and studies done on this too. Um, so if that's your only perception of a native woman or a native person, then that, you know, we need to start undoing that sentiment, um, especially with Hall of Halloween, you know, that happened just recently. We saw a lot of these costumes and, um, so we need to start addressing that and calling that out when we see it um, as, as individuals, but also um, I think, you know, as tribes and 
So let's see. I'd like to point out that our next speaker Thursday <laughs> at two is Gloria Grant, who's going to be speaking about border town racism. And I encourage everyone to attend. She's an excellent speaker. <laughs> Absolutely. I listened to her presentation and it was it was really great. It was um, enlightening. And so this final question, what are my clans? Uh, my clans are To'ahana, near the water clan and Kia'ani, uh, towering house clan. My, my dad's Nakai. Um, and so I think with that, um, I just want to thank you um, all for your time. <laughs> and I'm Geraldine Yazi's aunt. <laughs> so Hello, niece out there. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you all for your time. And um, I'll turn it back over to you, Gordon. And I will in turn turn it back over to Annabelle. I, but first, I want to thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I would encourage everyone to come again on Thursday at 2 to hear Gloria Grant talk about border town racism. So Annabelle, I think it's up to you and to Diana. Oops. Um Hello, I just wanted to go ahead and thank both of you for doing this presentation today, Stephanie, beautifully, like, and so descriptive and so thoughtful and so informative. So thank you for all of that information. If you guys are interested in, like Gordon mentioned, on Thursday, we're going to be having Border Town Racism at 2 p.m. with Gloria Grant. And if you are interested, um, you should be, you should have received emails where you could register for that as well. And thank you, everybody. And I hope you have an incredible rest of your day. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Annabelle, are you still there?